Morning. There we go. Uh, so I just want to welcome you. Thank you guys for coming. I see a lot of uh, visitors, so let me introduce myself. My name is Jed Werlein. I'm the campus minister here at Ortez Valley location. The uh, past couple days, we've had the honor and privilege of hosting the Reasons to Believe conference, and th these gentlemen have been all over the place. They were able to speak at Marshall, West Virginia State, Taze Valley Christian. Uh, yesterday, we hosted uh, at the St. Albans campus, campus a whole day of great sessions with, with Fuzz Rana and as well as uh, Dr. Hugh Ross. And, and don't forget, tonight is the, uh, uh, we're going to close the conference tonight uh, at 5 o'clock. We're having a kind of like a finger food kind of reception that uh, our, our uh, Sisters of Gateway group is putting on for us. And then our final session will be at 6. So show up at 5 to eat. Six o'clock, we'll, we'll dive into the last session. And so that, that brings me out to introduce our speaker today. And uh, you're from Poker, right? Yeah. I graduated from Poker. So he's a dot. So uh, we're, we're glad to have uh, Fuzz here. And uh, he's going to share with you uh, uh, just uh, some amazing information. Uh, and uh, uh, so we uh, ask uh, that you just uh, let's welcome uh, Fuzz Rana this morning. Well, good morning. You know, it, the last time I was in West Virginia was 2017, and actually Gateway invited me to come and, and do an apologetics conference. And so it's great to be home, and I always uh, just forget how much I miss West Virginia until I come back and just get to be in the mountains and get to, to interact with just such friendly, wonderful people everywhere you go. Um, you know, uh, as you can tell from my my girth, I like to eat, right? And, uh, you know, coming back here isn't the best thing for my, my, my figure, but I love to eat. And yet I'm not very adventurous when I eat. Whenever I eat something, I want to make sure that it's something that I know is going to be good, right? I don't want to, I don't like to experiment, but I'm just curious, how many of you are adventurous when you eat? There's a, there's a few of you, yeah. I admire that. I admire people that are willing to do that. But from time to time, I can be convinced to try something new. Usually it takes an extraordinary circumstance. But um, a few years ago now, a team of us went to Charleston, South Carolina to do a, a conference, a science faith conference for a church. And so we arrived on a Thursday, and that evening the people that hosted us wanted to do something nice for us. They took us out to dinner at a really nice restaurant. It was one of those places where there's not prices on the menu, right? And I uh, haven't eaten at very many of those. But one of the items on the menu was shrimp and grits, right? Now, I, I grew up here, so I know what grits are. Believe it or not, a lot of people in California don't have a concept of grits, which is very interesting to me. But anyway, and I just didn't think it was such a great idea to put shrimp on top of grits. That was just my, my sense. But somebody in our dinner party ordered shrimp and grits, and they looked like they were really enjoying it. So the next day, I was out exploring before the conference began. It was lunchtime. I popped into a restaurant, and lo and behold, shrimp and grits are on the menu. And so it turns out that that's actually a uh, a, a local specialty in the Carolinas. If you go to the Carolinas, you can get shrimp and grits. Now curiosity got the better of me, and I said, I just have to try this. And so I ordered it, and to my surprise, it was really, really good. Right? And so the moral of that story is sometimes we think things don't belong together. And yet when we take, have the courage to try to put them together, we oftentimes are surprised at how well they fit, right? And that's a great metaphor for science and the Christian faith, is that many people have this perception that science and Christianity are in conflict with each other. In fact, that is the dominant narrative that you see in the culture at large. And in fact, in 27. No, 2015 now, the Pew Research Foundation published the results of a survey where they asked the question, are science and faith in conflict? And 70% of people who never attend church or seldom attend church said yes. That doesn't surprise me because in our world today, people operate with the, the assumption that science is about truth, right? And if science is true, 
and it's in conflict with Christianity, well, then Christianity must be false, right? So it doesn't surprise me that people that don't attend church would see this idea of conflict. But what was discouraging to me was 50% of people that regularly attend church saw conflict between science and faith. And there's probably a number of reasons for this, but my ultimate concern is that there are people in our congregations who are afraid of science, who probably are concerned that there's going to be scientific discoveries that will turn their faith upside down, that will make their faith un- untenable, that, that they might even begin to view scientists as the enemies right, as enemies of the faith, that, that they may have doubts that they're struggling with, that they're afraid to articulate, and it can even lead to an environment in the church that is anti-scientific. And this is, to me, grievous because as our message at Reasons to Believe is that science and faith are in harmony with each other, that, that the latest discoveries in science provide clear evidence for a creator, that they provide clear evidence for the reliability of Scripture. Uh, in fact, we argue that the, the revelation of, of the creator through the creation is so powerful that we can actually use scientific discoveries as a way to build a bridge to the gospel. And so our mission at Reasons to Believe is to open people to the gospel by revealing God and science. And that's what I, I hope to be able to do here this morning. Now, I love the the scriptural passage that we read this morning together because that is one of those passages that teach us that God has made himself known to us through his creation, right? That this is part of God's revelation to us is what he has made, that we can not only see his fingerprints, but we can appreciate his attributes as well. And so if science is about studying nature, then we would expect that science should in fact uncover very clear evidence for a creator, very clear evidence for a creator. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. But before we do this, I want to spend a little bit of time looking at a passage from Romans 1. This is another passage like Psalm 19 that emphasizes the fact that God has made himself known to us through that which he has made. And here is, this is the introduction to a a letter that Paul has wrote to Christians in Rome. And this is actually setting the stage for what will become a theological masterpiece from Paul that gives us an understanding of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. He's giving theological meaning in light of the Old Testament to the Christ event. So this is what Paul says. He says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without an excuse." So here Paul is pointing out that God is going to bring judgment against those that are wicked, against those that are unrighteous, and that he is completely justified in doing that because he has made himself plainly known to people. To such a degree, they have no excuse. They can't say, I didn't know that you existed. And the way in which he has made himself plainly known to all people at all times under all circumstances is through that which he has made. But Paul goes on to point out that it's the tendency of human beings to misplace worship, to misdirect worship. We have a tendency to worship the revelation as opposed to the one who has revealed himself to us. So he writes that although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things 
rather than the creator who is forever to be praised. So Paul is drawing from the second commandment, right? To make no idols. And he is pointing out that we are idol makers as human beings and that we will make idols of the creation and worship the creation and not the creator. And sadly, I see this among many people who are scientists, is that they stand in awe before the creation. They marvel at the world that they study. They, they see design. They see th- these, in the, the, they appreciate the intricacies of the creation and the more they learn the more they marvel at it but yet their worship is actually the creation oftentimes not the creator but in honest moments these scientists will recognize just how powerfully the creation does point to a creator they'll recognize the theological implications of what they discover so what i want to do this morning for as much time as I have, is to go through discoveries that have been made in different areas of science, particularly those that involve origins, and show how those discoveries actually are anticipated by Scripture and how scientists in honest moments react to these discoveries. And the first place we're going to begin is with the universe itself. And this is the study of the universe is called cosmology. It's an area of astronomy. It's called cosmology. And in a nutshell, what scientists have discovered is that the universe had a beginning. That matter, energy, space, and time, these are the fundamental qualities that make up the universe, had a beginning. Right Now, this is profound because if the universe had a beginning... It means there must be something that caused the universe, right? If something begins to exist, it has to have a cause. And that cause has to be greater, right, than what came into existence. So there is something that caused the universe that is outside of the universe, that is independent and separate from the universe, that brought the universe into existence. In theological language, that would be a transcendent cause, which is how we understand God. And so what astronomers are discovering is that there is a cause to the universe that is outside the universe itself. George Smoot, who won the Nobel Prize for, a dis, uh, for heading up an experiment that discovered the most compelling evidence for the universe's beginning, said, what we have found is evidence for the birth of the universe. It's like looking at God, Right? And of course, when we read Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Science has affirmed that, or Hebrews 11.3. You know, by faith, we understand the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made from what is visible. Now, something else that is important to, to take a look at is the idea that time itself is understood to have a beginning, Right? Now, this is really a bizarre idea that time had a beginning. It's, it's impossible for us as human beings to even conceptualize that or even to articulate that time had a beginning. Uh, John Barrow, a physicist, said, there was no before the beginning of our universe because once upon a time, there was no time. But what's remarkable is that this idea of time having a beginning is embedded within Scripture, it's, it's part of biblical cosmology. Uh, Paul, as he writes to the church at Corinth, said, we speak a message of wisdom among the mature, not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden, that God destined for our glory before time began. Now, in addition to discovering a beginning to the universe, Astronomers have also discovered that the universe appears to be designed so that life is possible. That if the universe was any other way than it is, life simply couldn't exist in the universe. And the way that physicists and astronomers know this is because the fundamental constants, the the numerical values that scientists use to describe the universe have to assume precise exacting values. And if even one of them 
deviates almost imperceptibly from the values that they hold, life simply can't exist in the universe. This is called the anthropic principle. Anthropos is the Greek word for humanity. It's the humanity principle. It's the idea that the universe appears to be designed so that life is possible. Sir Fred Hoyle, who was no friend to Christianity, was the scientist who discovered some of the first evidence for this design in the universe. And this is what he said. It's like a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology. And when I think about the anthropic principle and the fact that the universe appears to be designed so that life is possible, I think of, of the, the, the passage that we, we read together this morning, Psalm 19. In addition to the design in the universe, there's now really good evidence that the earth too seems to be precisely designed so that life is possible and that if the earth wasn't exactly the way that it is, life simply couldn't exist. But it's not just simply the earth, which has a whole list of just right features that make life possible. We also have to be part of a solar system that has a just right sun orbiting at a just right distance. We have to have just right planetary companions, a just right solar system. We have to be in a just right galaxy, in the just right location, in order for life to exist. All of these things have to be just right. Sometimes astronomers refer to this as the Goldilocks hypothesis because everything has to be just right for life to exist. And this is what uh, Peter Ward and, and Don Brownlee say. Uh, a re, a, these are two planetary scientists who, are, again, are not believers and in their book, Rare Earth, they said, a review of habitable zones for animals as well as microbes and in the galaxy and universe as well as, well as uh, around our sun leads to an inescapable conclusion, Earth is a rare place indeed. A habitable zone is just a region in space where life is possible. They go on to say, if some godlike being could be given the opportunity to plan a sequence of events with the express purpose of duplicating our Garden of Eden, that power would face a formidable task. It is unlikely that Earth could ever be truly duplicated. And again, we have passages like Isaiah 45, 18, right? That says, for this is what the Lord says, he who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. So again, Scripture seems to be anticipating this discovery of the fact that the earth seems to be rare, maybe unique in its design, so that it is able to support life. Okay, well, let's shift gears from the cosmos, and now let's focus our attention on some of the, the, the smallest systems in the universe. And we're going to be talking about the molecules that make up life that are the, the basis of life itself. Uh, and one of the things that is remarkable is how powerfully biochemical systems display evidence for design. In fact, I was an agnostic when I started graduate school. I didn't know if God existed. And yet it was this, the elegant design of biochemical systems that convinced me there had to be a creator. And that opened me up to the gospel. But that design, again, is, it permeates biochemical systems. In fact, uh, one of the most extreme examples of design is something called the genetic code. And we don't have time to get into the, into the remarkable design of the genetic code. Uh, but maybe if you're interested, we could talk about that um, in between services. But the code is exquisitely optimized. In fact, the degree of optimization is astounding. And this led an evolutionary biologist by the name of Simon Conway Morris to say, the genetic code found in nature displays eerie perfection, startling evidence of optimization. For me, when I began studying biochemistry, I saw God's attributes, his divine nature, his eternal power in the, in the, the, the molecules that make up life. Now, um, let me, I'm just going to skip these. 
just for the sake of time. The design that we see in biochemistry is also evident in biological systems. When we look at organisms, they are remarkable in their design. In fact, the design of living systems is so elegant and sophisticated that it's actually inspired an area of engineering called biomimetics and bioinspiration. And what these engineers do is they copy designs in nature to create new technologies. Uh, and this is one of the most, again, fruitful areas of, of, of engineering. This is interesting to me because not only does it highlight the elegant designs of biology, but it raises a question. If, if biological systems are the product of evolution, an unguided, historically contingent chance process that co-ops existing designs and cobbles together new designs, you wouldn't expect that kind of a process to produce systems that we could study and learn from and then in turn create new technologies. But if God is responsible for the design in biology, then we would expect that, that uh, as a, a possibility, that we would, it would make sense that we could do that. And when I think about what's happening in biomimetics, I think about Job 12, right? This almost seems like a verse that is calling for the use of biology to inspire engineering. Ask the animals and they will teach you, or the birds of the air and they will tell you, or speak to the earth and it will teach you, or let the fish of the sea inform you. Which of these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? Now, when it comes to the history of life on earth, uh, we, we see thing, something rather remarkable, is that every time there are key transitions in life's history, those transitions happen explosively where life goes from one regime of complexity to another in an explosive way. It, it looks like a creation event or a signature for creation. And one of those examples is the, the first appearance of complex animal life on the earth. This happens in the earth's oceans, and in a geological instant, animal life forms appear out of nowhere. Somewhere between 50 to 80% of the animal phyla that we know of show up in a geological instant. This is called the Cambrian explosion, the Cambrian explosion. And this defies an evolutionary explanation. Kevin Peterson said, although the Cambrian explosion is of singular importance to our understanding of the history of life, it continues to defy explanation, at least from an evolutionary perspective. But when I read about the Cambrian explosion, I'm immediately drawn to the fifth day of creation that says, so God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems. The, the text seems to be describing that all of a sudden, life appears, animal life appears in the oceans, and this is exactly what we see with the Cambrian explosion. Okay, now, Let's talk about human the origin of humanity. Many people will point out that humans and chimps have these biological similarities, have a 99% genetic similarity, right? You've all heard that. And that, that this is evidence that we must ev have evolved from a shared ancestor, that chimps are our closest living relative. And in fact, people will use that genetic data to build these kinds of evolutionary trees, right? You've, you've seen this. Well, I would argue that the genetic similarity between humans and not only the chimps, but other organisms isn't a reflection of our evolutionary history, but is actually a reflection of the fact that we are made by a creator. And why would I say that? Well, if you look at Genesis 2, Genesis 2-7 describes Adam being made from the dust of the earth and God breathing the breath of life into him, right? Well, Genesis 2-19 describes the beasts of the field and the birds of the air being made from the earth as well, from the dust of the earth, but they do not receive the divine breath. Only humans do, which says that what separates us from the animals, what, 
what gives us uniquely God's image isn't our biological makeup, but it's something special about us. And yet, at the same time, we share biological similarities with the other animals. And that means that we would expect there to be anatomical, physiological, biochemical, and genetic similarities between humans and other creatures. This is, not, this is something that the Bible essentially points towards with the Genesis 2 account. Now, when it comes to the origin of humanity, something very interesting has been discovered, and that is that if you look at the genetic variability of people around the world, you can literally trace the origin of every person on the planet back to a single female individual, and the, gene- and the genetic diversity of every man on the planet can go back to a single male individual that are called mitochondrial Eve and Y-chromosomal Adam in the scientific literature. And that this data indicates that humanity originated recently from a single location near where we think the Garden of Eden would have been. And so this is really interesting in light of what the Bible tells us, that human beings come from an Adam and an Eve, and that when Genesis 3.20 says, Eve was the mother of every living person, this is actually demonstrable uh, with regard to the mitochondrial Eve concept. We also know that, again, the Bible tells us that humans are made in God's image, right? This is what Scripture teaches us, that human beings are made in God's image. And if I had to point out one feature of humanity that reflects the image of God, I would argue it's our capacity for language. And the origin of language is a really difficult problem for evolutionary biologists. They don't know how to account for our, or the origin of our language capability. And so instead of language emerging in this slow, gradual process where there's proto-language that then becomes simple language and then later more complex language, we see language seemingly appearing all at once in human beings. And that the very first language is as complex as current language. There's no evolution of language. Uh, a, A paleolinguist at MIT, Miyagawa, said, the hierarchical complexity found in present day language is likely to have been present in human language since its emergence. Uh, Ian Tattersall, Noam Chomsky, and some others write this. By this reckoning, the language faculty is an extremely recent acquisition in our lineage, and it was acquired not in the context of slow, gradual modification of pre-existing systems under natural selection, but in a single rapid emergent event that built upon those prior systems but was not predicted by them. The relatively sudden origin of language poses difficulties that may be called Darwin's problem. And again, when we think about the origin of humanity, this idea that we're made in God's image is so critical. It's the foundation of Christian ethics. It's the foundation of the gospel itself. And because we bear God's image, we stand apart from all other creatures. We are the crown of creation. And that we have been granted dominion over the creation because we are image bearers. And that allows us to enter into that special relationship mediated by Christ with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So I know that I went through a lot very quickly. uh, But what I'm going to do is just summarize everything that I talked about, right? Because, again, it's remarkable to me how the Bible seems to anticipate the discoveries of modern science, right? So we have, for example, the Bible teaching us that God created the universe and we know that the universe has a beginning, that time had a beginning and science has discovered the beginning of time. This is part of the space-time theorems of relativity, that God's glory is revealed in the heavens and we see the design of the universe in the constants of physics that God carefully crafted the earth for life, and we have the rare earth hypothesis, that 
God is revealed in his creation and we see incredible designs in biochemistry and in biology. That God is responsible for life and that life's origin appears to be miraculous. We didn't discuss that, but, but that is, again, something we can add to the list. That God is responsible for the history of life and that there's a number of features that we see in life's history Uh, like the Cambrian explosion, that seemingly point to a divinely orchestrated history of life. Uh, That we see that humans and animals are made from the dust of the earth according to the Bible, and what science has discovered is that there's shared biological features that humans have with other animals. That God made humans in his image, and we see that humans are unique in our capacity for language, and that this language emerges suddenly out of nowhere when humans appear on the scene and that humanity came from a single man and a woman and we have the concepts of mitochondrial eve and y chromosomal adam so in other words it's shrimp and grits right that 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 there is incredible and remarkable you know evidence from science that supports the notion that there is a creator and that the Bible is indeed reliable. And what, what do I want you to do with this this morning? Well, if, if you're here, I hope that at minimum, as a Christian, you are at least encouraged in your faith to know that there's evidence from science that supports what the Bible teaches us about God as creator and about his creation, that the Bible is trustworthy. Maybe some of you might even want to go a little bit deeper and learn more about this uh, and and maybe even learn how to use this to share your faith with other people. And towards that end, what we have for you is a gift that if you scan that QR code uh, and fill out some contact information, we will email you two e-books. One's called What Darwin Didn't Know. The other is Genesis 1, right? A Scientific Perspective. These are two of our most popular ebooks, just as a gift to, to you and to help you begin that journey to grow deeper. And if you're here this morning and you have doubts about Christianity, or if you're not, maybe if you're not a Christian, I would hope that this would inspire you to pursue a relationship with God, uh, to, to reactivate your relationship with God or to pursue a relationship with God, uh, because the evidence points to the reality of, of God, and I would pray that you would be someone who doesn't worship the creation, but in fact worships the creator through the person of Christ. So with that, I'll go ahead and, and uh, I guess invite the worship band to come back up, and we'll uh, end the service.